So in today's video, I'll give you an easy breakdown of serotonin syndrome, the mechanism, causes, and how we manage patients. If this topic is something that you don't feel comfortable about, then you're in the right place. If you end up learning anything, please hit the like button. It helps with the YouTube algorithm, so someone in the same position as you can also see it and learn from it. Thank you. So serotonin syndrome is simply when the body has too much serotonin. And this is due to the combination of medications that are serotonergic. And I'll discuss what all that means later on. But next, let's learn a little bit more about serotonin. Serotonin is a monoamine neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter meaning it transmits messages from nerve cells to parts of the body. It's a monoamine, which is just referring to its structure. It's derived from an amino acid. And here are some other examples of monoamine neurotransmitters, like the catecholamines, such as epinephrine, noepinephrine, and dopamine. And there are other ones also, such as melatonin and histamine. So as I mentioned, serotonin is derived from an amino acid, specifically tryptophan, which is found in foods, which then gets converted into 5-hydroxy-L-tryptophan, and then finally into serotonin. So as a neurotransmitter, it transmits messages from nerve cells. So let's visualize this. So this is pretty much a neuron releasing serotonin as the messenger to act on serotonin receptors, leading to a response or function. And of course, the function depends on which part of the body serotonin is working. And the three most common places serotonin works are in the GI tract, in the CNS, and also in platelets. Majority of the serotonin is released by the enterochromaffin cells in the GI to help with the digestion, but even before the food gets into the intestines, serotonin sends messages to your brain about the food that just entered your mouth. Now, in the CNS, most of the serotonin is found in the brainstem, where it pretty much controls all human behavior, emesis, sleep, and body temperature regulation. Now, in platelets, serotonin is just stored there. Platelets do not produce serotonin. Your main function is to aid with platelet aggregation. So now we know what serotonin does in the body in normal circumstances. So then what will happen when you have too much serotonin like we see in patients with serotonin syndrome? Patients will present with mild to severe symptoms, so mild symptoms include mydriasis or dilation of the pupil, diaphoresis or sweating, hypertension, tachycardia, diarrhea, and involuntary muscle movement. And lastly, these patients are usually afebrile, but patients with severe serotonin syndrome present with the mild symptoms plus a fever and also muscle rigidity and delirium. Patients can also present with even more severe complications, such as seizures, renal failure, respiratory dysfunction, which can lead to death. This is why as pharmacists, we must understand what causes serotonin syndrome so we could prevent or manage it. Serotonin syndrome is caused by medications through several mechanisms. Increased production of serotonin, inhibition of serotonin reuptake into the cells, inhibition of the metabolism of the serotonin by the monoamine oxidase, increased serotonin release, and finally, directly stimulation of the serotonin receptors. Serotonin syndrome typically occurs when a patient takes two or more of the medications with these mechanisms. Let's look at some examples of these medications. L-tryptophan is an example of a medication that increases the production of serotonin. It's sold as a supplement and it's the precursor of serotonin. Medications that inhibit serotonin reuptake prevent it from moving back into cells to be broken down. And these include SSRIs, TCAs, St. John's wort, tramadol, dextromethorphan, and cyclobenzaprine. Inhibitors of monoamine oxidase prevent the breakdown of serotonin. Examples include linazolid, methylene blue, and selegiline. Increased serotonin release from cells can be caused by ecstasy, methadone, meperidine, and dextromethorphan. And finally, medications that stimulate the receptor directly are bilspirone, dihydroergotamines, lithium, LSD, meperidine, metoclopramide, and the tryptans. The fact that we know the medications that increase the levels of serotonin, we have to be vigilant as pharmacists when reviewing patient medication orders. The best thing is to prevent it by educating patients and improving awareness. Patients may not know exactly which medications are serotonergic, but they can at least keep a list of their medications and 
tell the physicians to review it for serotonin syndrome before prescribing anything new. This can go such a long way because as you've seen previously, these medications that increase serotonin levels are used for different diseases, so it may not be one doctor prescribing it. So physician education is as important also. And as pharmacists, we want to review patient profiles for these serotonergic drugs and prevent the combinations. Sometimes, depending on the combination, you may get an alert or warning to weigh the risk and benefit and monitor closely. But sometimes, it may be a contraindication, so you must avoid it completely. This always applies to SSRIs and monoamine oxidase inhibitors combinations. Lastly, if a patient is transitioning between serotonergic agents, physicians should implement a safe washout period to prevent overlap. Washout periods may differ among medications depending on their half-lives. For example, Cetraline has a washout period of two weeks, while fluoxetine requires a washout period of five to six weeks. Patients who unfortunately develop serotonin syndrome should be managed as follows. The treatment is based on the symptom severity. For mild symptoms, we begin by discontinuing the offending agents and then providing supportive therapy with hydration and then giving benzodiazepines to alleviate some of the symptoms such as hypertension, tachycardia, and the involuntary movements that we see in the patients. Now, please keep in mind that this is all occurring in the hospital, so we have to monitor the patients closely. Patients with moderate to severe symptoms, we follow the same recommendations as we do for mild symptoms, plus the use of 5-HT antagonists such as cyproheptadine for severe agitation and hyperthermia, esmolol or nitroprusside for the blood pressure, and patients with temperatures over 106 should be intubated because of the possibility of hypoventilation with such high temperature and muscle rigidity. And that will be the end of this video. This is a topic that you will learn in pharmacy school, but trust me, you will see a lot of these medications in clinical practice. So it's best that you familiarize yourself with these medications and also understand the importance of prevention. So as pharmacists, we want to always look out for these combinations. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, and follow me at Pharmacist Academy. Thank you for watching this video and take care.